All right, today I want to talk about time and, and, and what defines us with our time. There's an interesting, famous quote from Harvey McKay. He was and is, he's 92 years old and he's, he's a businessman. He's still active columnist, writing post each day, you can see it online. Um, and very successful, very successful man and, and author. He writes a quote, time is free. It's free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. And once you've lost it, you, you never get it back. You never get it back. It reminded me of Jesus' words in Revelation 22, right at the bookend of, of, of God's word in, in uh, verse 12 and 13. Jesus said, Behold, I am coming soon. He's coming quickly. Re bringing my recompense with me, says Jesus, to repay each one for what he's done. And he puts it in some sort of context, some authority for what he says. He says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. How often we use this time, you know, we're given. How we use it affects our eternal reward. And this idea is often mentioned in, throughout God's Word in, in, in Old and New Testament. But here we see it directly from the, the creator of, of, time ourself, of time itself. He says, be careful how you use your time. We know in Ephesians 2, I'll just quickly read it in Ephesians 2 verse 8. Don't need to turn there, but it says, For grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. You can't earn it. It's a, it's a gift of God. It's, it's not a result of works. And no one may boast. But, but there's something for us to do. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, there's no doubt that we're saved by, by grace alone. Uh, the sense of uh, this uh, responsibility, the stewardship of our time spent, how we use it on this earth with our physical days and it having an impact on what's ahead, you know, of, of the eternal when we're with God forever. You can think of the parable that we read this morning in Matthew 25 that Joyce shared. You know, they were given talents freely. They were given. But there was a sense of expected to labour. They had a duty they had to do. And the master, Jesus, of course, talking of himself, um, you know, had some strong words to say for those who weren't busy. But then we see a reward they were given beyond any works that they could do. They were given much more than anything that they, that they could work up for themselves. They were, they were rewarded beyond their wildest dreams. Today I would, I would like to talk about how we, how we use our time so we can remain good stewards of, of the time we have left and this gift of life, both physical and eternal, that is to come. I wanted to do a little exercise. This, we know there's 24 hours in a day, but if we break it down just quickly, you know, nine, you'd say probably nine hours of sleep, including time to go to bed and, and time to wake up and that grogginess in the morning. We have about eight hours of, of work duties, you know, whether that's a, there's a balance of being in the office or, or home in working there, home duties. So that works up to 17 hours, but do my maths. Maybe an hour for personal care, you know, take care of ourselves, teeth and all that sort of um, things we've got to do. Cooking and eating and clean up, that's probably about two hours. You know, it might be a little bit different for you. Maybe for me, I do a little bit less cooking, but I help in other ways. And we've got to find our 30 each day. We've got to do about half an hour exercise or, or leisure. I have that release, you know. John likes to go out in the, in the shed, have tool time. Others might be a walk around the park or a combination. So that leaves, if you did your maths, leaves, that's 20 and a half hours. So that leaves us three and a half hours in the day. There's not much left you know, when we think about it. And of course, that's not three and a half hours straight, is it? <laughs> Especially when you're in the busyness of, of parenting that I know we've all been through, a lot of us, 
between all the non-negotiables, there's, there's not a lot of sort of quality block time, is there? We quick, quickly realise how little spare time we have. And that leaves us 11 and a half hours if we take off the sleep um, and minus our free time. 11 and a half hours, all those things that we've got to do, we can't really, they're unnegotiable. And the, the, the danger is being defined by them, those 11 and a half hours of things we have to do, <coughs> instead of being letting God define us, instead of God being our defining, the defining thing, the defining being in our lives. We need to, as you know, that scripture in Psalm, beautiful, I already read this morning, storing God's word up in our, in our heart. You know, we need to let the truths of found in God's word give us our identity and purpose. And that, that's the only way that we can become good stewards. Rather than the thinking and experiencing of the world, experiences of the world that, that shape us, you know, the things we go out and do, um, it, they don't lead to life, you know, by themselves and without God in the picture. Now, I had the thought, wouldn't it be easier if we could just go um, on a big desert, deserted island or maybe we could like, you know, put all our money together and we could get a big block, patch of land and we could have a little commune. And man, we'd, the sway of the devil and the sway of the world, it would be a lot removed, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be just easier? But Jesus tells us in John 17, he, he, he talks about this actually in his prayer that he prays. He says, well, it's not that easy. We can't just be separated from the world so then we can have more time with God. We've got to try and make priorities, set the time upside to be with our God. So John chapter 17 One of Jesus' great prayers in verse um, 14. I have given them your word. So he's praying to his father. And the world has hated them because they're not of the world. You know, we know we're called out. Just as I am not of the world. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. So Jesus says, I, I don't ask you for that. But that you keep them from the evil one. You know, or keep them from evil. We can't, it's not as easy as being taken out of the world. God doesn't want another devil, another, another Lucifer. He wants us to have a choice of two paths and it not to be given to us on a silver platter as it was with, 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 um, with Lucifer. He wants us to choose which way and he wants to help us to, to make the right choice. But he wants us to make a choice. Let's keep reading. 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. Now, Jesus was praying for his disciples here, but by extension, it's, he's praying, praying for us. You know, that this revealed, this God who's been revealed through his son, an incarnate word of God, so the written and then one that lives in us, that God, through his son, would be what defines us. Jesus would be our, defined, our, our definition. This is his prayer for his disciples. It was his prayer for us. And he, then he hones it down and prays specifically for you and me, not just by extension, but, but specifically he thought of you as he's praying to his father in the, um, here in, the, in John 17. Verse 18, he says, as you sent me in the world, so I have sent them in the world, sent them into the world. So he sends us out. He sends he sends them out. We can't just can't be separate, live on an island somewhere. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. He did that for he did that for us. He, he was without sin. Tempted in all parts, then he could help us to, to come along on that journey, become a new creation. Yeah, but we see it's more than it's more than just for our good, you know, to be sanctified. It, it extends past everything that God does is for the greater good, you know. Just like Jesus, uh, Jesus excuse me, Leah, my wife, with the kids, you know, it was it was to bless others. 
with what the story with David, you know, to this golden rule was to help this good to then rub off on others so then they could be good and, then, and it could keep flowing. So it extends past ourselves and we've given this responsibility to be Christ's ambassadors. <coughs> Verse 20 here, sorry, is where, where we see where Jesus prays for us. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in them through their words. Now he's, he's directly talking about us. So he's praying for us. That they may be all one, just as you, Father, are, un, are in me and I in you, that they may also that they also may be in us. He's praying for us. And then there's a so that. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. So he wants us to be sanctified. He wants us to be a part. He wants to be defined by him. Just as he's defined by his father, they share this oneness. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. And we keep reading. We see the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. The glory that God, that, that, that God gave his son. He gives to us. That they may be one even as we are one. He places the spirit in us. He elevates us. He gives us this great worth that only God, the spirit of which, is, which God is made up of, he gives us a portion of that, makes us of more value than anything else. So they may be one even as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one. There's another so that. So that the world may know that you have sent me, what he said before, and that he... And love them even as you have loved me. So the same love that they have for each other in perfect oneness, the Father and the Son, they may know that we may be, as we defined, may understand this love and that, that love is God the Father have, has, on, has for us. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me. Because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made them known to them your name, you know, his name, his, his character, who he is. You can think about when he passed by uh, Moses up on the Mount Sinai, you know, his character, who God is. Jesus makes it known to us and will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. So this love that, we, that God has for us, that same love will be in us. So it would emanate part from us to others. It's a beautiful scripture. Because, you know, we might be the only potential time that, in that sense that people will be visited by God in this life. You know, as, I, as ambassadors, not that we're God, but their chance to see Christ in us. But only if we're defined by him. So it might be for only a moment. It might be words. Not even might not even be a few words. It might just be something that you do out on the freeway. John, back a few pages, John 15. The um, spring is upon us. And the, 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 gra- the grapevine's already starting to, to sprout. I am the vine, the true vine, Jesus said. And my father is the vine dresser. Verse 1, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you will be clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, says Jesus, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. It's interesting that the branches only produce fruit once a year. But they've got to abide the whole year round. Right? If, if you don't bear fruit, you cut off. There's no, you, you, you wither, you die. And even when they're being pruned... You know, it's part of that process, like we're going to be chastened, so that the, the tree can 
can, can not bear too many leaves and grow more fruit the next year round. Even when you think it, that when the tree looks so dead in the middle of winter, you think, and there's no life in there. It's do- in this dormant fact, it's, it's directing its energy because it's not having to grow up here. It's directing its energy down into the, into the roots to get as much nutrients as it can from that soil to be absorbed. You know, the vine to then shoot up new branches, stronger branches, new leaves, new shoots in spring. You know, likewise, in our daily lives, we've got to, we've got to use all that time available to us, all 24 hours, to abide to stay connected throughout the year. And we do this in various ways so we can produce fruit. So what's some practical steps we can take so we can abide in Christ and, and be defined by him, not by the world and, and everything around us? Well, Jesus gave us a purpose, perfect part in, six, in Matthew 6. He said, verse 33, don't turn there, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, seek first the kingdom of God. Is a, so my, point, my first point is we need to begin the day by setting aside block time dedicated to God, to let God's, God's uh, his presence and his word move us for it to start to, to, to affect us. So we need to put a time aside at the start of the day. Now you can use the Sabbath for an example. You can see how what a blessing this day is and we take one day in a week on a bigger scale, you know, we set one day apart, and that orders the other six days that's to follow in the new week. So we see the time, the value of time set apart from the world, you know, with the Sabbath. Likewise, it's, you know, there's something special starting the day, beginning the day. You know, I think there's a saying about conquering the day before it conquers you. You know, because... If you start the day with, with, with God and you spend that quality bulk time, you know, that, that block time, you, everything that comes ahead of you, whatever the day holds, you don't know what it's holding at that point. You claim God's promises. You draw on him. And everything you, that you have to act, you have to do and react as things come your way, you do it from a position of, of overcoming. You know, because you've, you've had this victory, you, you remember this victory, you're defined by it from a perspective as victors not victims, victors, ahead of time when you, when you take that time to start the day. If you wait to the end of the day, you, you've, the battle's already lost in that sense because, hey, something's better than nothing and we, sometimes we have those days, but our refreshed self's gone. We've got not much to left in the tank and you know, we try and pray and we might last two minutes and we fall asleep. We might try and read... We think, oh, this is too heavy. I just, it's too much. I'm spent. You know, in Romans, um, we're not going to go there yet. We're going to, we're going to, excuse me. Look, you know, think of Jesus' example, excuse me. You know, he, of what he did. He seeked his father's face first. He spent time in, in the gospels throughout. He went up into the wilderness. He went to a desolate place where there wasn't anybody you know, he went up to a mountain, he went out on the boat. Like, he, he took the time to prepare him for what he had to do next, for when, when he was going to be busy with people, with disciples that didn't get it, you know, with, with, with the people who were struggling, being persecuted, you know, the religious establishment who thought they knew it all. He started by taking time with his heavenly father and he took that glory that he... Just like Moses, his face came down from the mountain shining, you know. He took that glory with him then to do his will. But he started with the time with his father. Romans 12 verse 1. I appeal to you, to you therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship or your rational service. My footnote says... Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When we take this block time, just like Jesus did, when we sacrifice sacrifice of ourselves, you know, we give our time. It's a precious commodity. God starts to define us more. 
and more. And we start to realize his will of, of what it looks like for the rest of our lives, you know, the, the rest of our day. It's interesting that the, Paul talks about the renewal of, my, of our minds in, um, here in verse 2. It, it means a renewal or a change of heart and life. It's interesting because it's from the root word, uh, interestingly, renovation. You know, like in a home, I know a lot of us, a few of us done renovations in your home. It takes a lot of work, quality, intentional block time, you know, to, when, you, when you're working on your home. Likewise, the same is true to know God's will. It, it takes time. It takes to, to stir up his, his spirit, this gift that he's given us, and, and fan it into flame when we, when we spend time with him. To understand. Likewise, also talks about the the test this um, testing here in, in Romans twelve. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God. This word, Greek word, testing means to test, or by implication, as in it's not always clear what God's will is. You know, it's got to be gleaned through intentional time and and medication. Uh, meditation, sorry. You can't, there's no shortcut on that. You've got to wrestle the meaning, understanding of it, and asking God what the will is, because sometimes we don't get it. So that then we can go forth for the rest of our, our days, the rest of our lives. The second point I have is, you know, outside of that block time that we should start the day with, to have God in our mind, is, is we need to pepper our days with the things of God, you know. Um, 1 Peter verses 4, chapter 4, sorry. 1 Peter chapter 4. We've got to try and... Because we don't always have our time. We've got the things that we have to do. When I was thinking about this, uh, of a gentleman who starts very early in the morning to drive trucks, and I think, oh, for him to get up earlier, that's tough. But there's other ways that we can try and make time. 1 First, First Peter chapter 4, verses 10. As each has received a gift, use it as y- use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. In everything, God may be glorified. So if we speak, speak God's words as the opportunity arises. You know, we're, when we're out doing our thing, we, you know, we, we're out doing what we have to do, our responsibilities. If we're offering a service in our, in our work, do it by seeking God's strength, you know, his favour, his wisdom to, to do that job. And it would be not by our own capability. It would be a God thing. Because then he can do something with it. You know, as we serve, we can serve him through it. So we can be continue to be defined by God as we're going out and doing these things that we've got to do, these day-to-day tasks that we can't get away from. We also need to remember quickly in, in 1 Corinthians 10 that not everything we do, we can do, is useful and, and helpful. You know, it's not, it's not everything we do is, is of value. Verse 23 of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. You know, all things are lawful, but not all things build up. Not everything we can do in this life is useful. You know, it might not be sin, but it might not be helping us be defined by God. You know, or, or help others to jump on the bandwagon to share in this journey that we're walking. Jump down to verse 31. It says, so whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. There's some examples of this that might be challenged in, in peppering of our days for the things of God. Is what about the music that we listen to? You know, is it is it um, when we're doing a task, we're going out our thing, is it of value? Does it help us be built up? Is there any value in it? You know, to to understand God's majesty more in his creation or, or to sing the, mercy, the, the, the promises of God, to be reminded of it. What about the movies that you, that you, watch, that you may watch? You know? 
that we watch in the background, even when we're doing other medial tasks? Is it edifying? Does it help us on our walk to be defined, to, to turn around and, and, and walk towards the light? Because we know if the eye is, is dark, our whole body is full of darkness. What about the drive to work? Could we use it differently? Could we use it time to talk to God? Or could it be a combination? Can we, use, can we use it when we're sitting on the train to maybe listen to God's word, let it impregnate us, we, our, our hearts, you know? Um, it might not, we might not have the mind for reading, but maybe we can listen and let the word speak to us. This peppering of our, our time is really helpful it helps us when, so then when we, we get back, we've, we've completed our task, we get back to have some free time throughout the day. That we have, our thoughts can be more easily orientated back to the things of God because we're already thinking about it along, along the day. So we can orientate ourselves back to God and, and his service of what he wants us to do because they're, they're already there on our minds, they're on our, the tip of our tongue in our lips. And in so doing, you know, possibly not even realising that we're fulfilling the will of, that God has for us already. You know, we, we, pick it up, we pick it up and we're already doing what God wants. We don't realise because we, we're being so immersed in God's word, in time with him, that we just start to do what God wants us to do. We think, oh, I've got to call that so-and-so. Actually, I should go and do that. That would be really helpful. Instead of, you know, just serving ourselves. Ephesians 5, is, this is beautiful here. Look, verse 15 of, of Ephesians 5. Look carefully then how you walk, not, to, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. Because the days are evil, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be get drunk with wine, for his debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That too is part of God's will. So brethren, Jesus is coming soon. He's coming quickly. Let's, let's use our time wisely, all 24 hours. Not to be defined by the world. You know, it's passing away. Peter says it's going to be rolled up like a scroll. It's not going to be anything left. Let's be defined by God so we can continue to do his will. Up until that great day when we see Jesus coming, coming in the clouds. Every eye will see, every tongue confess. And Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master.